Another great pleasure of mine to introduce Bisma Anwar. Bisma is a licensed mental health counselor. She has a Master of Education and a Master of Arts degree in psychology, psychological counseling um, from Teachers College at Columbia University. She's a therapist at Talkspace and she has a private practice. Her areas of expertise include anxiety, cognitive behavioral, dialectical behavioral therapy, which is new to me, depression and stress management. She has, uh, she addresses um, a variety of mental health issues on her podcast, Therapacino, and her Instagram page. Um, I encourage you to check them both out. We had a wonderful, wonderful conversation in preparing for this panel. It was just lovely and really, um, it was just the highlight of probably my week that week, and so um, I haven't gotten a bill for that yet. I'm hoping it was all in preparation, um, but she's just a wonderful addition to the discussion today, um, so I'm happy to hand it over to you, Bisma. Take it away. Hey, hi, Erin. Thank you for that warm welcome, and i um, really excited and happy to be here with all of you virtually. Um, I think it's great that we're able to incorporate this um, into you know, making it easy for us to connect. And, um, you know, along with the, the work that um, was mentioned that I do, I'm also very passionate about community-based work. And I've worked alongside many Muslim uh, organizations and uh, schools and in hopes to, you know, advocate for the need of mental health services and to destigmatize a lot of um, you know mental health stigmas which we find in the you know Muslim community as well as many other minority communities so I'm really happy to be presenting you all today with you know going over one of the, the um, projects you could say that I was involved in and I'm going to just share my screen um, sorry it seems to not allow me to do that if Thank you. All right. All right. So this this one is about suicide prevention amongst Muslim adolescents. So I'm going to be going over suicide facts, definitions, and risk factors, um, you know, because I understand not everybody is from a mental health background. So being able to define some of these things is important. And then I'm going to share a case study about an adolescent who was experiencing suicidal ideation and the intervention supports and outcomes in this particular case. So some facts about suicide and mental health, and these are according to the latest stats from the National Center for Health Statistics. So suicide ranks as the 10th leading cause of death in the US, and it ranks as the third leading cause of death for 15 to 19 year olds. So this is to really kind of understand how this the need for mental health, especially amongst the adolescents has become more and more important. Uh, children aged 12 to 17 years were more likely to have received any mental health treatment, which included uh, medication as well as taking prescription medication in the past 12 months. Um, and this is 12, uh, this is 16.8% compared with younger children, five to 11 years. So again, just highlighting the need of mental health services amongst adolescents and why that's important. So to go in a little bit to definitions, particularly around, so suicide is what we call death, which is caused by self-directed injurious behavior with any intent to die as a result of the behavior. A suicide attempt is a non-fatal self-directed potentially injurious behavior, which may or may not result in an injury with any intent to die as a result of that behavior. And when we talk about suicidal ideation, these are thoughts of suicide that can range in severity from uh, having a, a vague wish to be dead, uh, which we call passive suicidal ideation, 
as to active suicidal ideation, which includes having a specific plan or intent. So amongst adolescents, here are some of the risk factors that have led to an increase in suicidality, especially recently. So recent or serious loss, which can include uh, many of these examples that you can see here, death, divorce, separation being some of the big ones. Uh, mental disorders, mental illness, particularly having a mental health diagnosis. When we say mood disorders, we are talking about depression, anxiety, um, and along the spectrum of that. Uh, feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, guilt, and worthlessness. Having a previous suicide attempt, a history of suicide attempts. Uh, alcohol or other substance use disorders having disciplinary problems in school, high, engaging in high-risk behaviors, uh, which can include substance use as well as, um, you know, other, other high-risk behaviors in the found in the community, um, sexual orientation, confusion, family history of suicide, uh, witnessing any family violence, uh, child abuse or neglect, lack of social support and being a victim of bullying or being a bully. So now let me get into this case study. Uh, I had this uh, young 14 year old South Asian female. She came in to me uh, saying that she felt hopeless and depressed and uh, we, we started therapy together. And so she would live with her parents, two of her siblings, um, you know, a brother and a sister, uh, also one preteen, one the teenager. She had no past psych history, had never been in treatment, had never taken medication or been in any kind of therapy. And she recently started high school. She reported feeling overwhelmed by things such as changing schools, losing her old friends, moving to, you know, having a bigger caseload in ninth grade. Uh, it's, it, you know, just sort of having that big shift. And she reported also instances of being bullied by some of the other uh, girls in her class. She reported to me that she was feeling depressed, anxious, having low motivation, feelings of hopelessness, and having low self-esteem. She shared that she was having difficulty sleeping and eating. Uh, she had had two panic attacks recently while she was in school, uh, and she was unsure of what triggered them, but just said in that time, she felt st more stress due to tests. One thing I wanna say here is she actually was uh, in a Muslim school, in a Muslim community-based school, and. Uh, there's also, you know, uh, sort of being a small Muslim private school, lack of uh, resources to mental health services, which is something I'm going to touch upon in a little bit. So she first started to experience these symptoms six months ago when she first started high school. And over time, these symptoms began to get worse. And then when she told her mom how she was feeling, the mom also connected it to a decline in her grades and that she was also isolating herself more at home. So kind of noticing that behavior. Another aspect of her um, behavior was that she started to uh, engage in what we call self-harm, which was cutting. And uh, she started to feel that there was like a sense of relief that she found when she cut herself. And she usually engaged in this behavior whenever she was feeling more stressed out. Uh, she said she always felt worse right before she was having a test in school or after she had been bullied or had a negative interaction with one of her classmates. So in terms of her social history, she was born and raised in New York, had attended um, another Islamic school, and this was like a new one that she had gone into high school for since the age of eight. So not necessarily like a new, completely new environment, just sort of more about like high school related. And she enjoyed playing sports and was in, you know on the soccer team, basketball had also, but recently reporting not having enough energy to play as she often did before, which is sort of aligns with, uh, you know, depressive symptoms. And she described her relationship with her family members as okay, that she was not very close to anyone in particular in her family. 
and there was no family history of psychiatric issues. Um, her mom reported that she had anxiety at some times and that there were some family members that may have been depressed, but no one had ever gone treatment again because you know there's such stigma attached to this and lack of awareness around uh, the need for getting mental health services. Uh, just going through the rest of her uh, sort of history, case histories, like no substance use, uh, she, you know, in terms of her trauma history, she shared that, you know, her father could be verbally abusive at times, but she denied any physical or sexual uh, abuse history and no legal history or aggression towards others reported. When we went into her suicide risk assessment, her current risk at the time was low. Um, so she, you know, she said she had suicidal thoughts and, uh, you know, to either cut her wrists or overdose on pills, but she never attempted anything and had committed to safety at the time when I did this assessment with her. Her protective factors were her parents and her siblings. She lived at home and she would never want to hurt them by doing something to herself. So she had that insight in that moment um, as well. She could be impulsive at times, and so that was where the cutting behavior that she engaged in uh, was at least once a week at the time. And whenever she would get triggered, when she was feeling depressed, overwhelmed, or anxious, she would engage in that. So our plan was, moving forward, was to engage in once a week therapy and uh, to attend a support group for adolescents in the school and engage in safety planning behavior. So when I was looking at this case, um, these are some of the things that I really looked at. And so understanding that she was a daughter, student, and a community member, and that there's the role of the family, the community, and the school in terms of helping and supporting this adolescent. So with the family unit, it was parents and siblings. In the community, we were looking at the neighborhood, the mosque, the community center. When we looked at the school, we were looking at the students, teachers, and administration. So in each of these, I identified the risk factors. In the family, it was lack of awareness amongst family members, inability to validate children's feelings and thoughts. In the school, it was bullying from other students, lack of resources in the school in regards to mental health, which I touched upon earlier and lack of training in suicide prevention amongst the school staff. So when, for example, when she had a panic attack or when she would maybe share with another um, student that she was having suicidal thoughts, there was an instance where this student uh, became really alarmed and shared it with the teacher. The, the teachers were, uh, you know, talked to her, spoke with her, but they did feel like they weren't really trained in suicide prevention. And because of that, they wanted to you know, sort of understand how they can better help and support her and other children that are going through mental health uh, issues and, and expressing things like suicidality. And in the community, identifying obviously uh, like lack of resources available to help the individuals and families cope with the mental health issues, as well as the stigma that is related to mental health. Um, in terms of applying the interventions, what, um, what we did is first it was engaging in family therapy. So I engaged the family uh, in therapy and I provided you know, psychoeducation for them around suicide prevention, sort of similar to what we were going through before and sort of explaining terms and what it means, uh, depression, understanding depression and the risk factors that you know, can make a person feel worse the safety planning around the suicidal uh, thoughts and uh, you know risk was also something that was very important to involve the family in and also individual therapy was recommended for the parents uh, which they they could pursue uh, in the school uh, i was actually part of the board uh, for the school at the time and so i was able to you know sort of initiate uh, program and we hired a part-time school counselor who came in to provide individual and group therapy with the students. Um, she was able to do assessments on the students that were identified that were going through certain mental health issues that had been observed by the teachers and also crisis intervention. So for example, this 
particular student had another panic uh, attack and uh, she was on site, this school counselor, and she was able to help her uh, go through, you know, deep breathing and kind of bring herself back to a sort of feeling more uh, better and okay to go back to class as opposed to before when um, the school would just call the mom and the mom would come and pick her up. And, you know, that would sort of be the end of it. So in this way, you know, the child was also made to understand how she can kind of self-regulate uh, her intensity and her, you know, feelings and emotions at the time if it led to a crisis. Um, we also conducted a workshop, um, myself and a school psychologist with the seventh and eighth grade parents, which were identified as more high risk at the time. And uh, there had been some students that had uh, shared some mental health issues, not as obviously serious as this particular student, but along the lines of that. And then also we provided a, there was a Muslim mental health first aid um, for the youth, which was provided through an organization uh, that I'm also been involved with uh, is Muslims Thrive. And then they also did a training for all of the teachers uh, on self-harm, suicide, and depression in schools to be able to help them understand a little bit more that when the students are expressing these things, like what is it that they can do to help and support them? Uh, in the community, we were able to organize a few workshops and lectures on mental health through um, one organization called the Khalil Center. We had a school psychologist and therapist come in and also conduct these. And we also rounded up a, a list of mental health resources to share with the community. Uh, and I probably should have mentioned earlier, but I'm based in New York City. And so this was uh, all sort of based there in the community. And these sort of uh, resources that were shared with them were lo local to the area. And the next steps that we really identified here was to conduct a needs assessment, to develop programs, to target the most mental health issues, and then um, and sort of really take it from there. Um, obviously, the world has gotten to be, you know, with the pandemic and things like that. So lots of like things shifted and moved around. So I think we were able to do our needs assessment, but also weren't able to really put into place everything that we had hoped to. Um, but I think that's sort of been a, a work in progress on my part um, with along with the community and trying to help them uh, put these things into place. And again, reinforcing the need for mental health services, especially now more than ever. Um, these are just some of the resources here uh, that I had, you know, the things that I had shared. And yeah, um, so I'm, that's, that's it for that part. And thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Vizna. I appreciate that so much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to invite Ashani uh, down, who's going to make some uh, closing remarks from us. Um, while she's coming down, Mike, do we have maybe one question um, from online that we can take? Um, I just have a, I mean, I can ask a quick question. Maybe yeah. for people who focus on any particular health issue. Like they know everything in and out and then people take what they know from the health issues they work on and don't always fully grasp kind of the particular context. Like I'm curious, Vizna, for the work that you do, is there sort of a misperception that people have when you first start working with them or you start talking about your work that you have to over and over and over again like help them understand in the work that you do um, that you wish more people knew coming into it? Yeah, I th thank you for that question. Um, you know, it's really like, you know, when I was sort of like even preparing this uh, presentation, I was like, you know, I have to be mindful that not everybody really knows. Like for me, it's like an everyday suicidality, suicidal ideation, self-harm. Like these are terms that I'm very like, this is my world, you know? So I think I really, you know, have to be, I think with my community-based work, I've just gotten more and more mindful of the fact that I really need to explain and make people understand. And I've found to there is like receptiveness to it a lot more now than ever before. And people are really willing to listen if if I am sharing the information. So I think that's a, sh a shift and a change that I've noticed for the better, as opposed to before where there was more resistance and there wasn't as much understanding that this is something that we also need to talk about and really address and focus on. 
Thank you. We really appreciate your time today. Um, I particularly loved the diagram of the circles to see what a social support structure looks like from the clinical perspective and to think about how each of our organizations can fit into that. So um, I think you, you really brought uh, a different perspective to a lot of the conversation we were having today. So please join me in thanking Visma for her time today.